Is this good morning? Is it all right? Um, as we continue our our march through Second Timothy, we come to the end today, and um, let me let me get started here first. And can't talk and do this at the same time. Um. Um, and what was it that we said goodbye to Abigail um, many years ago? We said goodbye to my daughter, who we we sent off to college. And uh, I was such a uh, what do you call it? Uh, I was so, such a softy because the whole trip home, I'm writing a letter to her, and 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 I'm crying, I'm sobbing, you know, I'm saying goodbye to my daughter. It's so sad. Um, I, when when. Not, not the same thing with my my son, but very similar thing to my son when I we said goodbye to him. And every summer, every time I go back to see them, you know, and I hug them goodbye, a little tear wells up because I'm having to say goodbye. Let me tip it. Paul is saying goodbye. Uh, he's saying goodbye to his dear, dear son, um, Timothy. Paul knows he's about to die. And he has some last words to Timothy. What would you say? What would you say if you knew you were going to die? And I think probably a, uh, another situation we might think of is, let's say you have a business and you're handing it over to your son and you know you're going to die. What would you say to him? Well, Paul has a a calling and he's handing passing that calling on to Timothy and so he gives him a whole litany of things that he said don't forget this do this do this oh don't do this oh do this beware of this and he gives this whole whole litany we're going to look at that but as he writes this letter and he knows a end is drawing near he knows it's just a matter of time in fact he writes this letter in 67 AD and by 68 AD, he's dead. He's been beheaded. Um, he's already been into one court case, as we will see later, where they basically it's uh, the indictment. Uh, and then he's waiting for his next court case. He says, I've been abandoned, deserted by men. And that's our title, is deserted by men, but delivered by the Lord. Join me in prayer, and then we're going to take a mountain peak review flyby of Paul's message in this letter, and then we'll we'll land in today's passage. Pray. Father God, I praise you for another opportunity to open your word, uh, to study your word, to have the pressure of of, of knowing that. This day is coming when, when I need to stand up here. And, and Father, I, I pray that as I speak, as I present what you've taught me, and, and, and I pray that you would speak your words of encouragement, your words of challenge uh, today through your word. Help our hearts be ready to hear, Father. And I pray that um, your message get, gets through, gets through my, my language as I stumble along and, and try to try to uh, deliver your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I alluded to, Paul um, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so Paul in 1 Timothy refers to Timothy as his true son in the faith. And in 2 Timothy, he refers to him as his beloved son. And this book is all about this message. Timothy, fulfill your mission. Fulfill your mission. And we're going to go through a quick 100 mile an hour. Uh, <laughs> my son's calling. <laughs> um 100 mile an hour overview. So at the beginning, uh, he says, stir up the gift in you, Timothy. 
stir up the gift. And then he says, um, do not be ashamed of me in my change or the gospel. Hold fast to the doctrines that you have heard from me. Be strong in Christ Jesus. Don't worry. Don't fear. He says, teach others the things that I have taught you. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved, uh, an approved workman. And he sh shun profane and idle babblings. Flee youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Preach the word, Timothy. That's your number one calling. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Always be ready to preach. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Throughout the book of 2 Timothy, there are no less than 25 direct instructions to Timothy. This is only a few of them. Paul, <laughs> I would say, hammers Timothy with, here's what I need you to do, Timothy. Here's how you fulfill your ministry, Timothy. Here's the ministry that I am passing on to you. It's not easy. But besides this, Paul also is comforting Timothy. Um, I've lost both my parents. My, I didn't get, my mom was incoherent by the time I saw her, but my dad at the end was very, you know, I'm going home. Uh, he would joke because he would, uh, they when they were battling his cancer, you know, they take different pieces of him. And he says, the Lord's taking me one piece at a time. Um, but that was his way of saying, it's okay, Lee. It's okay that I'm passing because I'm going to be whole again. And I think that's what Paul says. That's what he said uh, previously. Um, and we'll look at it a little bit later, but Basically, he's assuring Timothy that it's okay, Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have a crown of righteousness waiting for me, Timothy. You just focus on the ministry. You carry on. I'm going home. So, Timothy, I mean, Paul says, my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And he says, finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. This is the passage just before what we're going to speak on today. So the overall voice, the overall feeling of this book is... It's a charge to Timothy, his son, and it's a comfort to Timothy, his son. Let's go ahead and read our passage that we have today. He says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You must also beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. 
But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prissa and Aquila in the household of Onesiphor, Onesiphorus. Ones, uh, anyway, her, him. Uh, uh, Erastus uh, stayed in Corinth, but uh, Trophimus I have left in Milatus stick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pruden, uh, Pudens, Linus, Gla Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Essentially, this breaks down to three sections. Paul is deserted by men, delivered by the Lord, and then some final greetings. And we're not going to really look at the final greetings except for what I just read. Uh, we're just going to look at deserted by men and delivered by the Lord. And we're essentially just going to walk through this passage. There's, We're going to see what God has for us. There's several things in here that we can glean, we can grow from, um, and then and, and a warning that we need to heed. First of all, Paul says, everyone has left me, except for Luke, his friend and physician. Luke uh, is the author of Luke and the book of Acts. Luke was a physician. He was caring for Paul. Uh, he was a faithful friend, a uh, trusted companion. He stayed beside Paul, and he would come day and night to check on him. For at least two years, he was doing this. And Luke's purpose was really twofold, right? He was one to minister to Paul. But secondly, he was writing a two-volume work, Luke Acts, and he was Paul was his main source. And so Luke is with him, caring for him, but also writing. He also says, Demas has forsaken me. Who's this Demas? Demas was a faithful companion at one time. For in Colossians 4.14, he sends greetings from Demas. And then Philemon 24, he refers to Demas as a fellow laborer in the Lord. So Demas at one time labored with him. But it says that he's forsaken him. And that word forsaken means utterly abandoned. He completely walked away. He, I would imagine this means that he didn't say goodbye. He just left. He couldn't handle it anymore. And why did he do that? For the love of this present world. Paul saw, probably saw in him a pull, a desire to be a part of this world. And this is our first kind of warning. This kind of scares me. Because we might walk faithfully. We might be faithful in our walk and with our ministry and but one day we might walk away. I've seen, we've seen, uh, you've all seen marriages been together for 30, 40 years, and then they separate. And you think, why? How is that even possible that you've been so long together? Demas was enticed by the world. He was pulled away. And that's, like I said, it scares me because I feel that pull sometimes. I want to be part of that world. I want to be popular. I want to be with the in crowd. The worldly goods, the worldly passions. So sometimes they they feel it'd be nice to have that. I don't want to walk away though. And to be honest, I fight against it, and we fight. We need to fight against it. We need to. This reminds us to, we need to be diligent daily to seek the Lord. Diligent daily to seek the Lord. 
Um, and like it says, apparently Demas, from everything we see, was he was described as a fellow worker, yet he was pulled away. We know that Demas walked away from the faith, uh, but we don't know. I mean, he walked away from Paul, but we don't know specifically that he walked away from the faith. Um, however, we do know that in James 4.4, 4, it says, uh, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? That's kind of scary. If you want to be a friend with the world, then, you, then that you're, you're saying that you want to be an enemy of God. So that's a kind of scary. Um, so we need to stay faithful. We need to stay faithful. How is it that people remain faithful for so long? I think it's because they know God's voice. They hear God's voice. And how do they do that? Because they're in God's word all the time. They're they're talking to God. They're 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 praying. They're studying the Bible. And I heard this thing on on a social media post, um, and I, I said have shared it with some people, but it, it really hits home for me. Uh, this preacher was talking, and he said, "You know, the other day I get this phone call, and I picked it up, say hello." And it was my wife, but I said, hello. And she said, hello. And I said, who is this? She said, this is Dawn. And I said, Dawn who? She said, Dawn, your wife. Do you think that really happens? No, it doesn't because I know Dawn. I know her voice. I know Dawn when Dawn is on the other side of the campus. I know her voice. Oh, I said, oh, that's Dawn. I know where she is. Um, so I know her. Do you know the Lord's voice like that? Do you know the Lord's voice so that when he speaks, you readily recognize his voice? Um, one of the problems is that too many people, too many wonder why God is not talking to them. And the problem is that you don't readily recognize his voice because you don't spend enough time with him. See, God's talking. God's always there. We need to be ready to hear, though. And if you're enticed by the world and you walk away from your, your scripture reading, from praying, you walk away from God, obviously hearing his voice is going to be much more difficult. If you're not in the word, it's going to be harder to know his voice. So be in the word. He then says that Christians left for, uh, went for uh, Galatia. We don't know who Christians is, but we know great, uh, Galatia was a place that um, Paul went to on all three of his missionary journeys. So chances are that uh, Paul sent Christians to Galatia with a message. Uh, it says that uh, Titus went to Dalmatia, and Tal Titus, the next book in the in the, the Bible, um, Titus was second to to Timothy as like he like the number two guy, uh, number two son. Uh, and then it says Tychicus he sent to Ephesus, um, probably to carry this very letter, probably to carry this very letter because we know that. Tychicus in uh, uh, Ephesians 6.22 was a carrier of the letter to Ephesus. And uh, in Colossians 4.7, he was a carrier of the letter to Colossians. So he was kind of in the employ of Paul as a, as a courier. Um, so all these people are not with him anymore, whether they've forsaken him or... He sent them away to do ministry, or they're just not with him anymore. And then, to make matters worse, he says that my first court case, basically his arraignment, because in Rome they did, like here they have an arraignment to see if the case is worthy of a, of a court case. 
And then the second one is the actual case itself. At Paul's first case, at his arraignment, he says, no one came to my defense. I had no public attorney. I had no people there to stand for me. And in Paul's gracious heart, he says, don't let it be held against them. May it not be held against them. He doesn't seek vengeance. He, I mean, he doesn't hold, he doesn't, uh, what do you call it, have any animosity in his heart. He just says, this is it. This is the situation. Then, to take matters another step, he says, Alexander the coppersmith, he has done a lot of harm. A lot of harm. He really fought against my message. Um, it may be Alexander who raised the, the issues and problems when he was uh, in Thessalonica. Alexander might be that Alexander. Um, but it's interesting here, he specifically says Alexander the coppersmith, kind of differentiating him from other Alexander. So we're not sure if he comes up in other places, but there are other Alexanders who he, he delivers one Alexander over to Satan in the sense of kicking him out of the church. So that might be this guy too. Um, anyway, no one came to his defense. Um uh, and then Alexander, so when, when no one came to his defense, he says, may it not be held against him. He was gracious. With Alexander, he says, the Lord will repay him. He says, you get him, God. <laughs> He's fighting against you, and, the, and you take care of him. Then he, and he warns Timothy, of course, stay away from him. Be careful of him. Beware of him. So Paul, in his last words, he's saying, I'm alone, Timothy. People have either forsaken me or I've sent them on the ministry. Paul, Luke's the only one here. As your spiritual father, I have no greater desire right now than to see you. Please be diligent to come to me. Quickly. Verse 4 9, chapter 4, verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 4, he says, I greatly desire to see you. Chapter 4, verse 21, he says, Do your utmost to come before winter. He doesn't know when he's going to die. And we don't know if Timothy ever made it to see him before he, he died. But he longed to see his son before he passed. And he says, Timothy, if when you come, bring three things. First of all, bring Mark. Mark, the same guy who, who caused the rift between Barnabas and him. Mark, the same guy who abandoned him on his first missionary journey. Bring him because he's useful to me for ministry. He will help me. He will care for me. He's a good man. He says, Bring my cloak. It's cold. It's going to get colder. Winter is coming. <laughs> Come before winter and bring that cloak. It's, it's a big, heavy wool thing. There's been some, uh, come, some conjecture that this word cloak actually also can refer to a container that contains books and stuff. But um, we'll, we'll stick with the, uh, the plain understanding. It's a cloak. He's cold. He, he needs warmth. And back then in, in the jail, you were responsible for everything. Similar to here, like if you're in the hospital, you're responsible for feeding the people and taking care of them. Uh, back then in jail, your friends are responsible for caring for you. They just give you a room. <laughs> um, and that's what Luke was there for, caring for him. And I'm sure Luke was getting tired too. And then he says, bring my scrolls and parchments. Bring the, the, my letters. Bring 
the parchments, possibly even including things that he, he could write on, you know, more, more writing material. Because if, if, if I tarry, I want to be able to write. So Paul's painting this picture, says, I'm, it's, and I'm lonely. I want you to come with me. At my, at, in fact, at this first, you know, at my first court case, no one was there. I was abandoned. But then his demeanor changes with these few words. He says, but the Lord. He says, I'm lonely. I want you to come with me. No one stood with me, but the Lord stood with me. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. This is a turning point in the apostle's closing words of this last letter. He started the section describing the hardships, and now he talks about the triumph. He started the section talking about being forsaken. Now he declares God's faithfulness. You know, in our down times, God is always there. He's, he's often waiting with the answers. Uh, he often waits to the last minute with the answers. We don't want him just to tell us now, but he waits. He says, I got the answer, but I'm going to wait till you're right up against it to see your, test your faith, to see how much you'll trust me, and then I'll give you the answer. Uh, we went back for Don's father because he was having his heart surgery and it seemed really dire, and then we got other news and uh, anyway, while we were there, while Don was there, he had pneumonia, and we thought we'd have to have someone there all the time with him. Um, and wonder of wonders, there's this lady in my son, uh, my brother-in-law's church, who has a ministry to to elderly people who are homebound. And wonder of wonders, she lives four minutes away from his house. And so they started going to see him. And I guess that's all it took because now all of a sudden he's getting himself up. He's he's making himself, you know, taking a shower and dressing up because he's got these other people, not family now, other people coming to check on him and he needs to be, you know, presentable. And so they say, you know what, we'll just, we'll go see him once in a while. <laughs> once a week, I think, right? Uh, he's going to go check on him once a week and see how he's doing. God had that answer sitting there. We didn't know. But at the last minute, he said, here's your answer. Often it seems that God, like I said, waits till the last minute. So this is instructive for us. This The next message is instructive for us because it says that Paul, I mean, the Lord strengthened Paul. so that the message might be fully proclaimed. See, God's per God didn't strengthen Paul because he's such a nice guy. He didn't strengthen Paul because Paul had worked so hard for him. He didn't strengthen Paul because you're in jail for my sake. No, no. He strengthened Paul so that the gospel would, be, would continue, that, so that the gospel would be proclaimed. He doesn't step into our lives because we deserve it or in any way have earned it. He steps into our lives so that the gospel can be proclaimed through us and by our story. Why would God reach down into his creation and save you and help, help you or save me and help me? so that you will glorify him and bring glory to him with your life. Through the proclamation of his kingdom, through your words, through your life, through how you live. If your conversion isn't bringing him glory, I would question something's not right. If you're living in the world, then, like we read, that's enmity with God. One of my one struggle I have 
uh, which came was apparent the other day, was that I tend to respond too quickly to things instead of stopping and thinking. Um, when we, that's a little thing, but it really uh, works on me. And if your sin doesn't work on you, doesn't bother you, your sin should bother you because your sin is what stands in the way of God's glory. Continuing God, uh, sorry, Paul uses the expression about being rescued from the lion's mouth. And the lion's mouth was a metaphor of those days that people used to talk about life-threatening situations, dire situations. We know Paul had many of these situations where, where God delivered them. And why did he deliver them? For the gospel's sake. And then the next, uh, after that, uh, he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. I don't know, being in jail seems like a pretty evil thing. Um, getting beaten seems like a pretty evil thing. But I think he's shifting to a spiritual understanding right now. He's, he says that God is rescuing me from the evil plans of Satan to try to keep me out of his kingdom. But God's going to bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. So, Paul went from being, you know, I'm alone, please come to me, I long to see you, to God has rescued me, God will rescue me, and will welcome me into his heavenly kingdom. I have fought the good fight, Timothy. I have a crown waiting for me. Despite my situation, I'm content. It's okay. I'm happy because God is with me. God stands with me, Timothy. Oops. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That's Paul's hope. And it's not just an empty hope. It's a hope he knows is coming for him. Do you know that's coming for you? Do you know for fact that when you die, when you leave this place, if you get hit by a car and die, do you know your next step is into the heavenly kingdom? There are many in here who do. There are many in here who will say, yeah, that is my, my hope. And that is why I live. That is why I do what I do. Is because... God has welcomed me into his heavenly kingdom and will welcome me. If you don't have that assurance, if you're thinking, how can you have that assurance? I was taught all my life that we have to live a good life. And if we live a good enough life, then God will judge us at the end, whether or not we get to come in or not. But it's not about how you live your life, right? That's not what your salvation is about. Your salvation is about how Jesus lived his life and how Jesus died his death. Once you get saved, God's spirit is with you and, and you don't want to live the world's life anymore because God changes. We used to say God changes your want to. Your want to changes. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to live for Christ. After the service, we'll have elders up front. Um, and if you need to pray for any for anything, or if you want to know about this, please come forward and talk to us. Um, we'll we can take you to a, a prayer room and we can talk to you there. We don't have to stand in front of everyone and, and talk to you. Um, make today the day when that you know that you're ultimate destination is with Jesus Christ. So kind of uh, just in, in, in by way of wrap up, when it seems that you are abandoned or forsaken or going through difficult times and it seems there's nobody there for you, God will strengthen you. 
for his glory. God will strengthen you for his glory. And I, I, I think Jesus puts it another way. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God will take care of you, but you have to seek him. You have to know him. You have to uh, grow closer to him, and He will, you will hear his voice. Father God, I praise you that you are there for us. Regardless of our situation, no matter how alone we feel, no matter how persecuted we feel, no matter how unfairly treated we feel, you're there for us. We just need to turn to you. We need to ask you. We need to talk to you. Help us to know your voice. Help us to readily hear your voice. Help us to daily be in communication, living moment by moment with the knowledge that you're with us. And help us share our, our highs and our lows with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.